Um, so what I want to do tonight is just maybe for people who might not be familiar with hydraulic fracturing, although I think we're all very used to it now, is maybe just do two or three minutes basic background to it. And the rest of the time I just want to talk about what we call the Aberdeen Report. This is a report that was commissioned by the EPA and Pat Rabbit's department last year to sort of look at the background to fracking. So it's a very important report for us because it will form a scoping reference for the main study to be carried out uh, next year. So the background, there's been gas in this area, it's been known for a long time. There's been 12 wells drilled between 1960 and 2001. And all the wells had gas, but the gas was deemed to be uneconomic. There wasn't an economic return to the gas companies. But anyway, in 2011, in the dying days of the last government, Petroleum Affairs Division, which is part of Pat Rabbit's uh, department, they issued licenses. So in this area, there was a license issued to Tamaran Resources. There was also a license issued to a company called Lanco, which have seem to have disappeared off the uh, the radar. The last we heard of them, they've been taken off the company's register for not filing accounts. And Energy Oil has been issued licenses in, in Clare. Tamaran also have a license in Fermanagh which co-joins the uh, Leitrim license and gives them a very big area both sides of the border. The licensing process in Ireland is a three-stage process. At the moment we're at stage one and it's called an options license. So this allows the company to do desktop studies, to look at the old well data, to access data from the TELUS border survey, which is the low-lying pla flying plane that some of you would have seen recently over the area. The license also allows them to collect rock samples and to shallow drill up to 200 meters. And so Tamron have put in a program of work to Pat Rabbit's department and provided they complete that and by the end of February they can apply for stage two, which is an exploration license. Now, they can apply at any time once they've completed the program of work, so it could happen <coughs> any day. The exploration license is another two-year license. It allows for deep drilling and test hydraulic fracturing. And if that's satisfactory, they can move to stage three, which is a full production license. So that means, and that's a long-lasting license that allows them to produce and sell gas. It's just a map of Tamaran's license area, so you can see the orange is Northern Ireland. The green is uh, Leitrim, Cad and Sligo. Uh, Lanco had the license for this lower part around Loch Allen. And the little stars are wells, previous wells that have been drilled in, in the area. The other thing that has really changed and has really brought us to where we are today is the technology has changed. So hydraulic fracturing or fracking the gas companies say it's been around for a long time and it's perfectly safe. And it is true, it was invented in about 1947 by Halliburton. But the technology has changed a lot over the last 10 or 15 years. And the big changes are horizontal drilling, the ability to turn the drill bit from vertical to horizontal and to follow the shale layer through the ground. The second big change has been multi-well pads, so drilling up to 25 or 26 wells from a single site. The third big change has been using these massive volumes of fracking fluid, up to 9 or 10 million gallons for each well. And the last big change is what they call slick water, the process of adding chemicals to the water to lubricate it, to allow it to be pumped down under less pressure. And the first time these four technologies were used together was about 2007 in Pennsylvania. So this really industrial form of fracking has been around for a very short while and it was exempted from clean air and clean water legislation in the US and that's what really gave it a big head start. This kind of schematic just shows you conventional gas, it's just a reservoir of gas tra trapped in rock, whereas the shale gas it's basically akin to a narrow bar. The gas is in tiny bubbles through the shale so they, they drill down and drill through the shale and fracture the rock, so open up existing cracks in the rock to allow the gas out. This slide just shows you in more detail what happens. They pump down huge volumes of water and chemicals, about 5% sand, 
and the sand just acts as a scaffold to hold the little cracks open and allow the gas to flow back up the well bore to the surface. So that's just really a very basic overview of fracking and if you want to ask any more you can ask any of us either in the discussion or after the presentation. So on to the Aberdeen report. So this was commissioned by the Environmental Protection Agency last year. There was a budget for it of €6,000. Now you don't get much in kind of terms of studies for €6,000, so this is what we got. Aberdeen University as well has very close links with the oil and gas industry and they used to have this on their website up to quite recently. These are all the companies that we have proud partnerships with. So all the big frackers are there, Halliburton, Apache, uh, ExxonMobil are there, Shell. <clears throat> so trying to get a non-biased study from this university is like asking a turkey to vote for Christmas. So what they said anyway in the report was that the objectives of the report, their job was to look at the potential environmental impact of fracking, particularly migration of chemicals and methane into groundwater, to have a look at the kind of geology and the role that the geology would play in allowing successful fracking to take place. They wanted to look at the regulatory approaches in other countries and they had this bit at the end which they called looking at possible best practice and one of the issues in that was fracking without chemicals. Now the report didn't consider a lot of other things that certainly I would consider to be really important and that was the overall environmental impact, the effects that it might have on human and animal health, effects on agriculture and tourism, the climate change effects which are, it has a very large sort of climate change carbon footprint and just the effects on the local community who would have to live with it. Um, so there are things that, that I think that a report, that, that I would like to see a report look at along with these kind of very specific things. <clears throat> so the main findings from the study is that this area has very complex geology and Davide who is here is a, is a hydrogeologist and he will cover that in a little bit more detail. The second main finding is that there is a limited understanding of how fracture processes occur in shale rock. They said that the fracking process itself, that once you start it, you cannot control the type of fractures that are created. And that the fracture network can be complex and difficult to predict. Now that's totally at odds with what the, with certainly what Tambra and other companies have been saying, that they, uh, they say that they're fully in control of it. But this study says that they're not. It talks about what they call geomechanical risks. So that basically means the risk of earthquake. And it said fracking inherently involves earthquake risks. And that comes from pumping large volumes of fluid into the ground and it's lubricated fluid. So if there's an existing fault under pressure, it can just allow it to move and trigger an earthquake. The report noted the two earthquakes in Blackpool. It stated that the earthquakes were very small and that they were sort of, you know, you could expect this kind of thing and they didn't do any damage. However, the report failed to note that the earthquake had damaged the well casings of the two wells that were drilled. And it later talks about how vital these well casings are to protect the water. It talks about the environmental risks. And the first thing it says is that there are relatively few published, peer-reviewed scientific reports. So for a scientific report to have traction, it's basically sent out to a body of experts who review it and accepted for publication. Now this Aberdeen report talks a lot about being based on scientific <coughs> studies and whatever, but it is in fact based on about seven scientific studies. Um, and some of them have nothing to do with, frac with fracking as such, they have to do with how rocks behave under pressure. Um, it talks about groundwater contamination and the report said it believes this to be the biggest local concern. But I don't know who they asked. They certainly didn't ask me, or I haven't heard of anybody else been asked what our concerns were. And for groundwater contamination, it says there are two sources, either the fracking fluid, which is, has chemicals added and has picked up another burden of chemicals from shale rock. And shale rock has got, any oil and gas bearing rock has quite a 
big cocktail of chemicals, including benzenes and toluene and everything. And it says the second source of groundwater contamination is the target gas itself, the methane. However, it says based on one scientific study, I think that the current opinion is that contamination was caused either by poor well casing or leakage at the surface, but not from the fracking process itself. And then it gives us these two diagrams, very reassuring. So these are the Marcellus shales. And what they say is that, like this is thousands of feet deep, and they said that the water goes this deep, and that we, well, we were fracking down here, so we've got this big space between the water and the fracking. And that's all very well for the states, but as Eddie and Davide will tell you, here they'll be fracking above a thousand meters. So these fracture lines would be right in the middle of these aquifers. And given that they can't predict them, and the fracture networks are complex, I think we might have some problems there. So the environmental effects continued. It kind of gives us a list of uh, all the harmful compounds found in shale. But then it's very reassuring. It says that careful monitoring of fat food and the produced water is required to prevent contamination from this source. I didn't realize that careful monitoring could prevent anything like that, but anyway. And it goes on to say that strict regulation is required to ensure that well casings and linings are properly constructed. It goes on then to talk about trying to source the vast amounts of water. So it says that sustainable sources of vast volumes of water can be challenging. Um, and then it has a few little notes on possible environmental impacts of having to transport all this water, construction of new roads, and the increase in, in heavy traffic. So fracking fluid disposal, it's, uh, it's very light on this, which is a major issue. So it just says there's more challenges in getting rid of it. And then it gives us a little outline on how they get rid of it in the States. So they either evaporate it or they pump it back into the ground or they dump it into another state if they let them. And it says that fracking fluid may be, or it might not, be classified as mining waste in Europe. And if it is, it will be subject to strict conditions. And the report then expresses the hope that uh, hopefully the chemical-free fracking fluid will be developed. Now it doesn't say that even if you do have chemical-free fracking fluid going down, it will be very chemical rich on its way back up. So there's a bit of uh, a little section in it on the atmospheric emissions. So it says methane can be released. It then cites, there were two reports in the States, one from Cornell which said that shale gas, that methane emissions from shale gas make it worse than brown coal. And then there was another report funded by the oil and gas industry which said, no, no, that's not true at all, it's, it's actually fine. So it, it kind of mentions those two reports. Um, and then it just says that fracking operators should seek to minimize all emissions and that monitoring processes need to be actively enforced. So then we have a bit of regulation or lack of it in other countries and what the situation is. So at the time of the report, um, Quadrilla in the United Kingdom had voluntarily suspended operations. Uh, while the earthquakes were being uh, investigated. So they got the blame for them, but they said that they'd go on anyway. So fracking is back in action in the States. France has banned it May 2011. Poland, it said that is no specific shale gas legislation, but they've recently granted over 100 licenses uh, to major players. In Bulgaria, they granted a license to Chevron, I think, in 2011, and then they changed their mind and they banned it in 2012, early this year. So in the USA, it's really major production, but it isn't allowed in some states like New York and New Jersey. In Australia, it's suspended in eastern New South Wales, and regulation is tightening now, <clears throat> tightening a lot in Australia, so they're not allowed to frack in state forests on public on good farmland, so they're pushing them out to areas where um, where they see the land is of having less value. And South Africa has a current moratorium on fracking. So that was best practice. So the last bit then was establishing best practice. And this is kind of was basically very aspirational, this part of the report. And they said that there's four areas for best practice. So they talk about monitoring assessment and then they say that um, 
you know, that the people who have to monitor and control this have to be adequately resourced and properly trained. And, and the people who will be responsible for monitoring it will be the Commission for Energy Regulation. And they have already told us that they have neither the staff nor the expertise to, uh, to monitor this, so that they'd have to buy it in. And the only place you can buy in this kind of expertise is from the oil and gas industry, which makes me worry a bit about the, uh, the kind of regulation we have. So then it talks about materials and resources. So it says that the wells must be properly lined, that the companies must try and capture as much gas as possible, that they must try and you know, reuse the fracking fluids. And it says further research is needed. And then it talks about media coverage, media coverage and public debate. And it says that everybody must be open and honest with the people in this area where fracking is going to go on, that they should come and tell us honestly what's going to happen. So it'll be nice, we're looking forward to it. So the summary, which came as a real shock to me after all that, was that the published studies suggest that there is a low and probably manageable risk to water. So this is based on seven studies. And then it says, less well known are the potential impact on the atmosphere from methane and the earthquake risk. So he does cover himself and say, oh, it's a very small number of studies, but this is what they say. So it says, more research is needed. Regulatory bodies need to examine all the research. And it said the regulation should come from, it should be European-wide regulation is the best way forward for regulation. Just my own observations on this is that the report is based on seven peer-reviewed papers and nearly all the other references are either oil and gas companies <coughs> or the newspapers or something else. And the focus of this report is, is very, very narrow. It glosses over the major issues <clears throat> and the language is very soft. I mean, it talks about challenges and, and then we're going to depend on strict regulation. And in this country, we're not very good at regulation. We see where banking regulation has brought us. And, and it says like, and then we're kind of going to depend on the operators themselves to minimize release of gas and lying well casings. So that's pretty much the Aberdeen report. Um, if there's any questions afterwards, I'll, I'll take them. Thank you very much.